I was really impressed with like just how big it is. It's massive, isn't it? They're big houses, yeah. You know, you look at something on a plan and you can show people plans, but they don't really, it's very difficult to feel volume. Um, you know, when you're selling houses, people are like, oh, I want at least 3,000 square feet. Well, you don't know what 3,000 square feet really is. You don't know what that really feels like. It depends on how it's laid out. You know, it, it depends on, to a certain degree, it might be ceiling height or windows, or there's a lot of other factors. Um, so it, that's kind of a starting point for people, but it's really when you get walk through the house and you walk in and you feel these spaces, that's what they're buying, really. They're not buying 4,500 square feet. They're buying a house that feels like this. And when you when I take people around, that's what's exciting to me is they're like, oh my God, you know, this is this is amazing. Look at the views and look at the size of this room and the volume of the, you know, the vaulted ceilings and whatever. We're not about how many of these, you know, four bedroom cracker boxes can we sell? We're about creating something that people just really fall in love with. And this is like their forever house. And that's our passion really is to try and build something that people love. It's an important purchase. You know, for most people, it's the most important purchase. And it affects how you live and how you feel about yourself and the world and life. You know, you spend a lot of time in your house. So um, I think it's important to try and live in a place that's beautiful and um, that's ergonomical, that works for you, that's a place that you just can't wait to get back to. Hi, I'm Andrew McMillan, and I run a company called Church Farm, but I don't. Uh... <laughs> Hi, I'm Andrew McMillan, and I run a company called Fountain Adventures, and we are developing a project called Church Farm, and this is episode two. So uh, about five months has passed, a um, little bit slower on site than we anticipated, but where we stand at the moment is the first house is going up. Uh, we have the groundworks uh, pretty much complete on a second unit, and um, a little bit further behind that is a third unit. Uh, there's been quite a few challenges, whether it's the weather, uh, just the fact that this is a, a new project and new construction methods. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what we've been doing with design, uh, what we've been doing on site with Groundworks, what uh, Clay's has been doing to manufacture the SIPs panels, and then we'll probably round everything up at the end with uh, what's gonna happen in episode three. We've switched all the construction around and got it to work everywhere else on all the other plots, but on that one, it's still putting some weight back onto that beam. Was that so, the steel that was running down the middle there? Um, so it's it is, on, yeah, yeah, exactly that, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's not on the outside, it's... it's... Well, no, it's the steel on the inside that's affecting the steel on the outside. So that steel now is gonna run the opposite way. So, the, so it's running down there? Yeah, they're, up, handing, up, up. It, yeah, they're handing it the opposite way around now. Uh, you'll probably remember from the first film, we talked a little bit about the design and that aspect of uh, building in SIPs is more complicated uh, than building it with traditional methods. That's probably accounts for a considerable amount of that five months. Um, obviously, we've been doing things on site and we have continued with the work, but um, until we could sign off on the drawings, uh, we couldn't actually manufacture the SIPs panels. I think with this process, I think what's unusual is, is you design it twice. Actually, on the SIP, you design it how you think you can design it. Then they go away and design it how they want to design it. Then you have to change it back to what you think you want it to be and then rationalise it to get it back and then coordinate it. So it's actually time consuming wise. The really, I think the really good products, but the lead on them's a lot more than you, you first think, especially when, you, when you've got one or two, it's not so bad, but when you've got six or seven, it's, it's quite tricky in terms of the, the organisation, in terms of how they work. But I think the product, once it comes, is good, but you've got to get everything built. right, yeah. perfect. That's done. the thing, the planning yeah. that goes into it to get the end result it is very much hard work, but when you get this, that SIPs build, then it's definitely worthwhile. Now, building with SIPs doesn't always have to be complicated. If you're doing a fairly simple structure, it could be very simple. But in our case, we didn't want to compromise the design to make it easier to build. If you're in the business or if you you know, if you consider yourself a student of design, you'll see an element of a building and you'll think, well, gosh, that why did they do that? Because it it doesn't look very neat or they maybe they could have designed that out so that you didn't see that and it looks, you know, slicker, basically. 
Um, but that takes time and money, and it's not always the easiest thing to do. But that's essentially what we've been trying to do. We're trying to build not complicated houses, but to the average person, they don't look complicated. But there's a lot of things happening on the inside. So what, what's the bit that's the issue then? If we, it looks like it's already worked out that we're going to come up through there. It's the majority of it is getting the ductwork from there coming here against the joists. Yeah. Because all the joists run that way. So, I think going from memory, you can only have the ductwork. Um, they've got to be two, twice the diameter separation. Yeah. MVHR is mechanical ventilation with heat recovery, and it's a centralised system in your house that provides you with fresh air all the year round. So it recovers the heat from the air leaving the building at the time and passes it past the fresh air coming in. So you get the benefit of recovering the heat from your house rather than like a conventional system of extraction where you just dump the heat out of your house. The heat recovery system, the mechanical ventilation, MVHR, we had to look at how we were gonna run all of those systems within the structure so that we had holes in the right places. We might have pre-cut holes in steels, um, in joists, um, which way the direction the joists are going in order so that we can get those, um, all that ducting in place. So that's another thing, uh, another aspect of design that you know, 15 years ago, you really didn't even have to consider, even 10 years ago. Um, but now all those are crucial to a modern house, particularly sort of an eco-friendly uh, house uh, such as this. And by eco-friendly, I mean, it's highly insulated, uh, triple glazing, all that kind of stuff. So from my point of view is, it's a bit of a no brainer. If you're building a leaky house, you don't need an MVHR system. But if you're building airtight, not necessarily a passive house, which obviously there is a requirement for it, but if you're just building a good energy efficient building, then why not fit it? So it's not just the engineers, not just, just the designers, but then you've got the window manufacturer. They had some unusual things that we had to work around as well. So we ended up having to go back and, and change little things within the window openings, maybe the thresholds, um, you know, we needed section design details, but that's another, that's another element that has to be designed at this stage because the windows are already being manufactured now, and that's on the back of the SIPS design. They're not, there's no on-site measurement. So, you know, you, everything has to be very precise, but hopefully then that means everything is, happens uh, quicker once we're on site. Right, you'd have to bring whatever you're doing, but to the top center, to this, between those two points, because that's where there's the ceilings going in, and then run them that way and that way across. I think some people might have given up uh, in terms of giving that, that much attention to the design stage, but most people will tell you um, that is absolutely crucial to get right because you'll only be kicking yourself in a year's time when you didn't spend a little bit of extra time making sure that something looked right or worked right because um, it's very hard to correct afterwards. So we, there, there's so many different people involved in the design aspect of it. As an example, you know, car charging. Uh, points. Well, pretty much you know, every house that's going to be built from now on is going to need a car charging point. That affects your um, electrical loading for each house. So it's all stuff that needs to be considered. And so as difficult as it was, it is an absolute important stage. And I think because we spent as much time as we did on it, I think that's going to pay dividends now, now that we're building it. So we're actually looking at maybe doing it slightly different on the next one. We didn't need a lot of the steel that's in this. The engineer didn't require it, but the company that is doing the form work said that they, they were used to doing it in this way. Um, so we let them do it in this way. It really only needed these upright steels to join the footings uh, to the dwarf wall. What it meant was that we dug it, but then you have to wait for them to basically install all the steel. And in the, in the meantime, you can get walls collapsing because of the water. It fills with water. That water combined with the soil turns to a sludge. So they were actually having to remove a lot of that by hand yesterday. So we may look at actually for unit nine, which is here, is digging it out and pretty much pouring it straight away. And then what they'll do is they'll drill these bars into the concrete rather than casting them in the concrete initially, which is what the engineer had specified. So this is a really crucial stage for the SIPs. 
That's where you've got all these lines crisscrossing all over the place and making sure that all this upright steel is in the right place. So basically they'll pour this, they'll then set up the formwork to do these dwarf walls and it's those that the SIPs will sit on. Now we're doing this because we're gonna have about six inches or 150 mil of exposed um, concrete that's gonna be on view. And that's the look that we wanted. It's far, it'd be far easier for somebody else who was looking at doing a SIPs house they, put, they could pour the foundations in a normal manner. They could build everything up in block um, or a concrete common or something that they prefer the look of, even brick, and then build off of that. Now that would be far, far easier than what we're doing, um, but it's because we just want that exposed concrete look, um, which you wouldn't get with a concrete common or block or anything like that. Where you have to cast everything and you're forming all of this, it has to be bang on because there's no, it's, it's very unforgiving because you're pouring it all at once. You know, you can't sort of, you know, with a block wall, you could be like, oh crap, that's out. So I'll take that down and let's just reline that or whatever. You can't do that with what we're doing. Talk through like the effects of the, the weather that we've had. What's that done to site? You know, November and December were pretty poor, but not in comparison to February. Storm Kira's arrival lived up to the forecasters' warnings. In Yorkshire, the rising waters left residents in a desperate race to protect their homes. Unfortunately, the way it landed for us is we were doing a lot of groundworks in the winter months, which you. I like to avoid if you can, but heck, you gotta build all year long, so sometimes it happens. At the back of plot six, uh, next to the vicarage, we planted three very mature trees. It'll probably cost us the best part of five or 6,000 pounds to plant these three trees, and all three of them got pushed over by the wind. Now, luckily, nothing snapped. They literally just um, took the ball root with them and just all leaned over on each other. So we have replanted those now, and I think they're gonna be okay. But um, you know, obviously there's a cost to all that kind of stuff and time and it's, it's difficult, but that's construction. And that's partly why companies are looking at innovative ways that they can do more offsite. The problems with construction are everything on site. <laughs> it's very rarely, is it something, you know, you don't have a problem with something that is manufactured somewhere. It's, it's putting that together on site and weather is the biggest problem. Um, but that's just, that's construction. This is probably the most complicated one on site um, because it's got two levels in this last section because it's back over the old silage pit, which got filled in. So of course you have to take the footings right down to the to the made ground. So yeah, that's a complicated little uh, thing that they're they're having to prepare. So anyway, over here then, um, SIPS is supposed to come uh, on Monday. And what we've got to do in the next three and a half days is, you can kind of see the steels there in the background because um, it's a little bit, well, not something, I guess it's more than what they would typically deal with. They're supposed to do that on Monday, which is too windy. It's a bit too windy today. 
because it's really tall and doesn't have any lateral bracing. They'll have to put some temporary bracing in, but most of the bracing is formed with the sips, with the glue lambs in the in the uh, the rafter beams and that sort of stuff. So unfortunately, that's after the steel goes up. We've then got to um, form around the four steel posts and fill that, um, which they may do that on Friday, but that would then preclude us from finishing that one little section, um, which is to, to fill it up with hardcore crush and run, uh, sand it up, um, so they've got a level surface to work from. If I just touch on one aspect of the groundworks, which is once they're bolted in place to the footings and they're concreted in and the rest of the structure is put in place. There's, there are purlings, there are glue lambs that run in between the two steel frames. So there's one steel frame here and one here and then you have these glue lambs that attach the two. Once all that's in place, everything is super strong. But you've got to put it up and it has to be strong enough to stay up while you're doing that. And that was the problem. So we ended up having to go back and they designed some bracing um, that had to go in temporarily, which was another couple of thousand pounds, for something that ultimately, once it's all constructed, we can just take it out again. We'll probably leave it in there, because on one side at least, because it's not affecting anything. The other thing was that it, we, the first time it went in, it didn't quite go in the right place. And again, you know, we might be talking five mil here, um, maybe as much as 20 mil in certain places, but we also hadn't designed in a way to make those small adjustments. And so for the next time we have learned, we're actually going to uh, cut out bigger holes in the plate uh, to go over the bolts, which will then allow us to uh, shim the frames in any direction, probably by up to 20 mil. So what we had to do this time was we had this fantastic guy who came and he came and cut holes around uh, the plates. And then you can, it's amazing how you can move a big steel structure without a crane, but with just a crowbar. But he was able to kind of move everything in place and manage to set it up exactly how we needed it, plumb, straight, parallel, you know, all the dimensions working out. That was complicated. Um, but we, again, we learned something from that and um, I think hopefully for anybody watching this, it's it's something that hopefully they can um, take advantage of what we had to work through and make it easier for themselves. I mean, like any building work, you don't you don't have to know how to do everything. You just have to you have to be willing to uh, read and ask questions and you know be able to problem solve and that sort of thing. You know, construction is I mean, there's skills involved in it, but but this kind of stuff is not about skills. It's about problem solving having the right people who do have the skills, um, organizing things in the right manner. Once this first one is up, everybody will be much more relaxed about it. Um, even the architect is, says he's you know, waking up in a cold sweat every night. Just because the tolerances are so small for the steel, uh, the engineer and the architect have a drawing, which the architect overlays the two to make sure that those are right. Then the steel manufacturer, he, they create their own sort of drawings for manufacturer. And the, and the architect overlays that, oh, so all three are overlaid. The window manufacturer, that gets overlaid as well. In fact, I, just before we ordered the windows, I think he, the big glazed screen, they didn't have quite right. And luckily he had overlaid everything and saw that it was slight, they needed to adjust it slightly. Um, so that's a lot of pressure when, you know, for the barns, for example, which we've been, you know, we've been cracking on with, I guess, but, um, that, that's so simple in comparison. What, how do you need to approach construction when you are faced with lots of things that are out of your control? How, how do you deal with that? I, I've had ex experiences where I, I've, you know, something's gone wrong and the contractor's like, well, I'm not paying for that. And I, you know, I don't think that's fair and I shouldn't have to do that. And, you know, a lot of times I'll just say, well, on, well let, let's, let's work on it together. Let's see what we can do. And, we'll, you know, I, you need to make money, I need to make money. Let's just figure out a way that we're, we can both go away, you know, at least happy that we've resolved it and, you know, we'll share in the cost or whatever. Whereas a lot of, a lot of developers and contractors have this adversarial sort of relationship where, you know, I've seen developers just like, no, nope, that's, that's your problem. You know, I'm gonna sue you. You know, it's just, that never, that never works. Um, 
you know, as far as I'm concerned, if I can't rely on somebody that I've worked with for a long time doing what they say they're going to do, I mean, obviously we have a, we have a price and we have a, an agreement in what's going to happen, what they're going to do. But so many people rely on a formal contract um, and then think when everything goes wrong that they just need to go back and go to this contract and say, no, you need to do this, you need to do that. And that just immediately creates a situation where people are just no longer working together. They're working for themselves. You know, I just like to think of it as that we're all trying to achieve the same goal at the end of the day. And, that you, and you have to be careful about what contractors you choose to work with. Because if they don't have the same attitude, you're not all pulling in the same direction. If it's all just about them, it's difficult. Uh, we are here at Sips at Clay's. Um, they're going to be manufacturing Plot 7, which is the first one to go up on site at Church Farm. And um, we're here at their manufacturing facility, which is in Skipton. And we're going to see how it's all made. So let's go have a look. Um, the third thing we were going to talk about is the manufacturing of the Sips panels. Obviously, once everything is signed off 100% uh, from the design, they can then create uh, a cutting package, um, which is basically all the plans broken out into the pieces that need to make up that house, um, which is kind of complicated in itself because it's not just like, well, I need a wall like this, but the wall is made up of components that have got different lengths, different widths, uh, a raking cut, an angled cut, and other sort of structural elements peppered in there as well. And we're going to show you um, the process as it happens in their manufacturing facility. So these are the cutting drawings you were telling me about that you produce? Yeah. So from the 3D CAD model upstairs, it spits out these, you know, just simply panel drawings. Right. So every single panel then has its unique reference number. Um, and it becomes a big Lego kit. But the key is obviously getting it right upstairs, bringing it down here, and then the lads are just cutting to all these dimensions that you see here. Well, as you can see, they've got a fantastic operation. Uh, Ian Clay uh, runs a really tight ship over there, and I gotta say, I'm super impressed walking around, seeing how they manufacture this stuff. They've got their processes down, which I think is the huge benefit in manufacturing something uh, off-site means you have so much control over what you're doing and the accuracy, transport, and everything else. And they do just an amazing job of it. You know, we're very lucky to have found them to, to partner with, and hopefully they're patient with us and it's our first time, and they know that, you know, we're, we're learning as we go, and it's something that they, you know, know like the back of their hand. Um, so I'm just hoping that we can continue to improve and make it easier for them as well. This is unusual because these are 140 stud walls, internal stud walls. Uh -huh. um, normally we're, we're, we're using, uh, those are yours as well actually, they, they, that's usually we just use a normal 89mm stud, but there's obviously some serious loading to use a thicker uh, a wall panel. Yeah. So the fourth thing that we were just going to touch on was really what we're going to do next in the third episode. And I promise it, well, I can't promise that it's not going to be a few months, but hopefully not as long as it took to go through the design process and all that. So once the structure is in place, the scaffolding stays in place because we need to do the roof. Uh, the roof we're doing with, uh, in conjunction with a company called Katnik. They've developed a, a, a material, a standing seam material of their own uh, with Tata Steel. Um, that we're really excited about. It's an easy to install uh, product. They're gonna come up and train our guys and that's really exciting. That should be happening within the next six weeks. Um, we've got Siberian Larch coming down from Scotland. The Siberian Larch is actually from Siberia. It's coming from a company called Russwood uh, in Scotland who produce uh, and source some of the best grade um, Siberian Larch, that's what we're using externally. The windows arrive March 23rd, so we're going to obviously be filming the installation of that. That should take about two weeks to put all those windows in, and there's some massive, massive windows. Fingers crossed that all goes well. Um, so that's the kind of thing we're going to be showing uh, in our third episode, is kind of how, how everything gets finished off, and we turn that kind of SIP structure into something beautiful. But that concludes episode two. Um, 
I hope you enjoyed it and thanks for watching and um, please stay tuned for episode three. Uh, if in the meantime you would like to contact any of the people that we're working with, please uh, look below for links uh, to their websites. Uh, feel free to subscribe to this and share with your friends. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, you can also contact some of our contractors that we're working with if it's something that you would like to pursue yourself. Um, so, yeah, bye. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why? Um. <laughs> pursue.